Businesses using generative AI technologies tend to focus on the accuracy of the results, but there is a creative aspect to the technology that can help as well. Can the technology move beyond the simple magic tricks that most users are experiencing, and can creative types use the tools to become even more creative? Coming up on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me on the show today is Michael Tedasco. He is a visiting fellow at the James Silverhead Brown Center for Artificial Intelligence at San Diego State University, as well as an AI writer and advisor. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. I've been looking forward to this because uh, you've been writing a lot of stuff on LinkedIn about uh, AI and uh, you had a recent series about um, uh, artificial intelligence in the movies and some, some very, uh, very entertaining p- uh, blog posts as well. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you real quick, how did you get in, interested in generative AI? Because your background, you were at PayPal and you have a non-technical approach versus like the, you've been studying AI your entire life. So tell me how you got interested in this 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 kind of technology. Yeah, uh, no, it's a great question. And and I think in part because I have a non-technical background is how I got so excited in generative AI. So to go back a few years, um, I I started my career in finance. And so like that, that is my background, finance, accounting, numbers, all that wonderful stuff. And if I fast forward to when I was at PayPal, I had the opportunity to run the innovation group there. It's very kind of odd for an accountant, an ex-accountant, to run innovation at a at a company like that, but but it, it worked. And one of the things that I always saw day in and day out, running innovation, talking to machine learning engineers who were building models and things similar today, although much more primitive several years ago. Right. I was always jealous. I was always jealous of the things that they were able to build and like, oh my God, I can do that. And then I remember the first time I ever got my hands on GPT three, it was magical because I didn't have to know computing language X or whatever it might be. I could just talk to this model and GPT-3 is very inferior to what we have today, but it was so magical at that time that I just got unbelievably excited to be able to talk to a computer in just plain English and just have it output things that I didn't even know computers could do, could output. And that's what really put me down this generative AI track, you know, Three, four years ago when I started really playing with it. Right. And then and then you were able to use that into kind of your work now that you're doing at San Diego State, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have an AI center at San Diego State. And I am I'm kind of the weird guy there as well, being like, you know, the finance accounting background guy. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean what I do there is a lot of teaching, mentoring. We work on projects related to mental health and robotics and do a lot of research in those areas and also just teach students uh, for more broadly at the university uh, that we have. So um, do that to writing and also the broader community at large. Yeah, yeah. What I wanna... I'd love to do is explain complex topics in simple ways that even I can understand. Right, right. And and I want to get into some of the things that you've done with GPT and, and some of the creative ways that you've done that. But but before we get to that, I want to ask that, you know, since you're in that university setting, do the students that you're working with and the others that you're working with, do they are they taking a creative approach to the technology as well? Or are they are they leaning towards that um, using the tool to get accurate results to answers and in, in, in that aspect? Because it always seems to be there's a balance between accuracy and creativity and, and the creativity side of it you see are magic tricks and then the accuracy gets gets attacked if if the answer is wrong for example no one ever gets impressed by you know a, a, an answer that's correct right <laughs> that's right exactly uh i like to think and i don't know if it was warren buffett that said this quote but i'm gonna at least go with warren buffett saying it um you know money makes you more of who you are so if you have a whole bunch more money, it will just magnify who you truly are as a person. I think in many ways, AI does the exact same thing as well. So if you are naturally a creative person, or if you just, I, I even just hate saying naturally creative because I believe that we are all creative beings, but if you're more inclined to it, if you've kind of been pushed down that path, be either by yourself or by others, you will find creative ways to use these tools. And that's what I see with students all the time. Like right. Some of them are a little bit standoffish, not comfortable. They might need a little bit more prodding, but for those who are kind of inclined to do those things already, well, they're just like, okay, I'm just gonna start riffing with this model, going back and forth. 
And that's where you really see like these beautiful outcomes where you could really just magnify our human creativity by using these machines. Right. So on, on the flip side, then obviously, you know, have you done a lot of work with businesses that are looking at the technology and going, OK, we need a we need that accuracy result um you know make a better chat bot so i don't have to pay us customer service rep that's the cynical side of me um yeah. but are you starting to see them maybe actually look at the creative side of of generative ai as well or are they still just in that zone of we need a tool that can um, pr produce accurate results based on this data that we have i i think for look for larger businesses i think this has been tough because they have their processes, they have all these things set in stone. For smaller businesses, for startups, for you know, who are just kind of willing, who just are scrappy by nature. Yeah. I think that's a much more open field for them to just say, like, hey, we're, you know, I don't have a lawyer, I don't have a whatever, I don't have a, a designer. I need an AI to do this that's gonna get me 95% of the way there, and then I'm gonna have a human get me the last five percent or whatever it might be. So I think this has actually been hard for businesses. I think businesses will get there, uh, depending on the industry. For many, the first reaction is we're going to use this to cut costs. Yeah. But that said, the one place where you're really seeing this is in engineering. Uh, engineering and engineer, like computer engineers specifically, software engineers, are really the first area that I think has really been embracing these tools. You know, they've been out for the last couple of years. They could do an amazing job coding. And what they're doing is they're allowing engineers to be more creative because a lot of the mundane code, a lot of the repetitive code, a lot right. of those things, a lot, a lot of the contextual, like, did you forget a semicolon, all this other kind of stuff, the AI can do that stuff really well, which enables the engineers to do more right. and more. And now, now for, for the examples that I want to talk about later, you know, in the, in this episode, I think we're going to talk about text generation, image generation, and then audio generation. So those are the three areas. Um, I, I, you know, I do want to do, I think I've done some episodes around the code generation part. Um, but since I'm not a coder, uh, it, 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 a lot of this flies over my head sometimes. The, um, I, I get it. I get it. I, you know, the, the last time I wrote a computer program was probably in eighth grade in basic. So, um, I get the idea of the, the whole mundane part of it. Um, yeah. and it's probably a lot more complex than that. So I want to focus on a couple of the things that you've done creatively. Um, and I, I'm going to list some of the things that you've done, and then I want you to, 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 to tell me which of these were your favorite and then some of the lessons that you've learned. So um, this was just based on some of the things that you've written about on your own, on your own blog. So one was, can GPT-4 raise $5,000 in 30 days? That was a crowdfunding type of a, of a, of a project. Can AI, rate, uh, can AI create a comic book? Um, and then you've, you've written an AI book under a pen name. Uh, you use the pen name, Alex Irons. Is that okay that I use that? Like if anyone's looking for that book, is that okay that I just it, reveal on, that? If you go on Amazon and, and, and look for Alex Irons, yeah. you will see Alex has uh, 13 books published. And you created yeah. stories with public domain characters, correct? Uh, yes. Yep. Yes, that is right. Okay. Sherlock Holmes fully went into the public domain. And yep. so we, Al Alex, the AI, had a, um, a Sherlock Holmes story for one. That's right. All right. So then you did something called Can AI Take Weird Al's Job? And I'm assuming that's with writing parody lyrics. Uh, can AI write an eighth grade essay about the Hunger Games? I liked that one. And then uh, does AI get the joke? I think you were trying to do stand-up material or were, was well i'll let that you was explain the simpsons in fact oh the simpsons right the right right you were having it analyze simpsons episodes to see if it understood the jokes and you had basic joke complex joke and somewhere in the middle right yeah yeah, yeah very, very very good keith yeah. yes and then yes. um and then the last one i liked was asking an ai the right way to eat a burrito so yes. first of all how do you like do, do these ideas just pop into your head and going oh this is what i i want to try or as you were experimenting with this stuff then you started thinking of these these things as you were kind of playing along that's great. Let's start with the burrito because that is one of my favorites, actually. Okay. Um, the, so the burrito actually came from just a family dinner time. So my my son who was twelve at the time, my daughter who was ten, were eating like there was a chipotle burrito that she had, and we were just kind of talking. And we often talk about AI or other geeky things like that <laughs> at the table. Um, and it, the inspiration was that is often you'll see like a BuzzFeed thing saying like, "Hey, here's a sandwich." 
do you eat A, B, or C next? And it generates all this buzz because everybody's very passionate about that. Yeah. And my daughter was eating the burrito. She tends to just eat through the center. So it gets like all, like kids do this. At a, it, you know, they do this with pizza. Yeah. Where they kind of have like the Joker yep. like thing going. Ice they cream. Got all the yeah, same thing. They just yeah, <laughs> smash the pizza in their face. Um, so it's just interesting enough. I'm like, oh, let's take a picture of that. And then I, you know, went on some services, asked like 200 humans, are they going to eat the sides? Or are they going to eat the middle? Humans say, okay, I'm going to, the adults say they're going to eat the sides, basically, A or C, if you will. Right. But I was just curious, what would an AI think? Because an AI hasn't been trained on this. AIs, they're trained on human language, mm -hmm. human knowledge, all the things that we have typed on there. They're trained on Reddit and Twitter and all of these things. But very little of that is just our day to day living. You know, very few people really go in depth on how the burrito eating process, what that looks like. Um, and so for us, it's largely intuitive. We learn by observation through just seeing what others do. AI doesn't. So when you ask an AI that same question, you know, so you got this kind of a U-shaped burrito, if you will. Um, you got all the yummy stuff on the inside. You ask an AI, almost always the AI will say, I'm going to eat B. I'm going to eat the center mm -hmm. of that. And because it sees the yumminess. It, it thinks that that's the way to go. It doesn't really think about well, right. what's the cause and effect of that. And so that is one semi-ridiculous example, though, of how far AIs really have to go to be human. Yeah. I'm saying that with boats, whether they'll ever actually be human, because there are so many things. Like, we think everything is online. It's not. Like, like the, just the world around us is where we still live, where we observe, that is really hard for an AI to grasp. Right. right. It, it seems like that from a lot of the examples that we talked about, that was the conclusion that, that you came out with with a lot of these things. It's, it, you know, it's, it's fun to come up with the idea and then see those initial results. And then you start realizing, oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's not perfect or it's not, it's not at the point where I want it to be yet. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, I mean, let me just kind of go through the list that sure. you laid out. So like AI, it actually is a decent job of understanding humor. I was kind of surprised at how well it was able to dissect a joke. And the thought there is, if you can dissect a joke, then you should be able to tell a joke. Mm -hmm. If you know why something is funny, you should be able to kind of recreate that funniness. That's kind of the theory I had going into that. And, um, you know, it, it, I took three different examples from one John Schwartzwelder written Simpsons episode, one of the frankly greatest television writers of all time. Right. And, um, and it was like, and I ran it through different AI models and I was really pleasantly surprised. Like generally their explanations were actually even better than my explanations for what made that thing funny. Right. And so like, that's like getting closer. Um, so, so taking that to a logical thing, you know, when I said this weird Al and risk of losing his job, one of the things I did was I took all the weird Al lyrics for like 70 different songs, took the original <laughs> lyrics, trained a model and said like, hey, original with this theme becomes this, now do this for new songs. It, that was really, really good. Did you <laughs> pick the, now did you pick the songs too or did you ask the AI to say, here's the, here's the theme and then you pick a song, like pick a song that would match the theme or is it more like, I ha write the lyrics for a song that parodies, um, I'm gonna use the, what the, um, the, um, H O T T O G O. That's the, uh, the 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 latest song that I know of from from the from Chapel Rowan. See, there's my there's my I, my Gen Z you, you, cred. I'm sure my kids would know about this. Okay. You have gone well beyond all right. my. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's go back a few years. All right, like all right. So let's you know. Did you say? Would you say something like, "Give me a uh, a parody of Sweet Child of Mine, but write it about pizza or something like that." Yes, Sweet. That, that, that's exactly what, okay. Exactly like it. I think in the article it was Christmas time when I actually wrote this. Right. Oh, oh and, and you hate that Paul Simon? Or that Paul Simon, the, the Paul, Paul McCartney, McCartney song. Wonderful yeah. Wonderful Christmas time. Yeah. Yes. I, I was like, I was like, you know, write a parody about Wonderful Christmas time. I forgot. I gave it a theme, and I'm like, make sure like. Like, or just talk about how bad this song is, is maybe even what I did. Right. Like, you know, usually Weird Al is about a food or something like that. But like, no. It, and, and like, honestly, it, it did a really good job. Like, it's probably 80% of the way to Weird Al, which is pretty darn good. Yeah. You know, like, I'm sure if Weird Al looked at this, he would say like, no, 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 no. It gets this wrong and all that. Because like, he is, you know, for 40 plus years been refining his craft in this. 
But, you know, to a general fan of it, it's like, gosh, this is darn, darn close. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, versus, you know, uh, the, the other one where I had um, just said, hey, AI, raise $5,000 for a charity. Um, ba so basically what I did was I flipped the script. Uh, there are these things called agents. And so agents are AIs that could kind of act autonomously. Mm -hmm. Sounds kind of scary. And, and theoretically, it could be. Um, but I was like, hey, agent, I want you to figure this out and tell me what to do. Okay. So I am going to be at your bidding AI. You tell me to create a Facebook account. I'll create that Facebook account, do whatever. Assume we have nothing. And our goal is to raise $5,000 for a second harvest food bank of Silicon Valley. And it was awful. It, it just like could not do that. Like it would tell me to tweet about this. There would be no engagement from it. There was no creativity. It was not even close. I, I think we raised like 20 bucks, but that was largely because I think I'd mentioned to some friends I was doing this. So, so it was almost like <laughs> some pity money. Like I don't think any civilians, so to speak, ever put any money into this type of thing. Well, that's what that's I mean, you know, humans have a hard time doing a lot of this stuff, too. It's it's. There's there's really not a playbook for, for example, creating a viral video. Like if you asked an AI to, to help me create a viral video, it would it would either give you the, the you know, it would go like, oh, just create something like Mr. Beast does or or, you know, do this. And it's like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, I, I don't know. It's it just feels like, you know, there is no real playbook because Some, sometimes people have no idea what what goes viral or not. It, it all depends on the, the zeitgeist or the, the mood at the moment, right? And the second you have a playbook and the second everybody knows that playbook, it's, that is not going to be what makes you viral anymore. Right. right? I mean, um, it, it's, you know, to, I'm going to quote Warren Buffett again, but, but Warren Buffett's predecessor, Benjamin Graham, who wrote um, the, the Intelligent Investor, you know, in the book, he would write all these ways that you can make money. He updated that book every 10 years or something because the ways that you could kind of beat the market and make money 10 years ago yeah. were not the ways that held 10 years later. Because once everybody kind of knows that, then it becomes something new and it becomes something new it is constantly evolving. Yeah, my, my go-to no. on, on, uh, on virality, whether it's video or, or social media stuff, is, is, uh, my to is the Today Show. Um, and th did I explain this to you before? I don't know if I did this no. on the pre-call, but um, uh, whenever the Today Show spots a trend, whether it's something that's going viral, once they do it, it's over. Um, because yeah. then at that point it's hit the mainstream and, and, and all the kids are onto something else or, you know, whoever is, is responsible for that virality. Um, and I noticed that because re remember that viral video, it was the Black Eyed Peas um, and it was the... Um, Everyone was doing these these one shot videos for that song. Um, uh, Tonight's gonna be a good night. You know that one. Where oh you, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I know it. And so, so every wedding has it. Right, song. right. Yes, so, yes. so a high school did it at one point where they did one long shot. And everybody was lip singing it, and it was like, and then it went viral, and everyone, everyone started doing this. Today Show did it, and they did it with all of their personalities. I was like, that's it. This is dead work. Because anybody trying something after the Today Show has done it, you're never gonna go viral. So yeah. no, no, that's right. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the exact same thing when you're, you know, if I start using the lingo that my kids speak in, my kids are going to stop speaking that. Way. Right. It becomes that they, like hello fellow kids type the thing. The whole purpose to have mom and dad saying the same words that I am speaking, so I will find a new way to way to speak, and this is how yeah. language changes and evolves. Exact same thing. Where, yeah. where, you know, when you did all when you did these experiments, were were there any ones that surprised you and that you you saw? Oh, this actually did a pretty good job. Um, I think you mentioned the the. Simpsons one was pretty good, but that doesn't re that doesn't mean that that AI could then tell a joke or write a Simpsons script, right? Just because you understand uh, what makes something funny yeah. doesn't mean you could write a funny joke. Correct, but but I think my hypothesis is getting closer. I think the one that did you know that you mentioned that does stand out is um, creating a comic book. Uh huh. Uh, I, I've actually done this twice now. Once probably about two years ago, and another one about a year ago. So I probably need to refresh it again today. And two years ago, it was pretty awful. I mean, I had one engine creating a script and then based on that, creating the images, the images would not persist. So like a character looks like this in one panel, they kind of look different in the next panel and so forth. You know, the next year, it looks a little bit better. There's more consistency with the characters and so forth. The script is a little bit tighter. Um, 
That's one where, look, it's not going to produce like like Watchmen or, or something like yeah. that. But for a kind of a, you know, a throwaway, for lack of a better term, type book, it's it's probably getting pretty darn close to something like that. Um, and, and, you know, the question that I have with this, like, so, you know, is it going to stop? Like, when, when does it, when is it that... AI is going to be surpassing us. Like, will that ever happen? Will it just hit a natural plateau at some point? I mean, from what I've seen, it keeps going forward, you know, kind of creeping forward, improving, improving, improving. I don't know what would naturally give that plateau where it's not going to improve anymore, where it can't get to like the Frank Miller or Alan Moore or Taylor, Ed Brubaker yeah. stratosphere up here. Um, but I don't know. We, I mean, we haven't seen it yet. So I, like, it's, I, it's yeah, theorizing, it, but it's it, getting better. It feels to me that at that basic level that we're starting to hit the plateau on some things. Um, but but then again, I've also, I've often been wrong. <laughs> and so, you know, and then another app or another tool comes out that goes, oh, this is this is something that that is useful and something that's better. So I don't, yeah, I, I think. There's a professor out of Wharton named Ethan Mollick who talks about this a lot, and and I and I kind of strongly hold this opinion as well. Even if like the AI models stopped today, they just like said, "Do you want GPT 4.0 and all this is like the best we're ever going to have?" Yeah, we're going to still uncover a lot from these models that we haven't even found out yet. We're going to realize, oh my gosh, there's all these things we could do. So like, even if they stop making new models, you would still see probably improvement for three, four years to come, just as we uncover more and more things of like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know the model can do that. I mean, again, these are generally pre-trained models. They're kind of meant to do anything um, that is potentially out there. And so with these like limitless, nearly infinite possibilities of what they can do, I, there's still a ton more room for improvement in right. the models. And I, and I want to, just for the moment, I want to avoid the questions of the copyright and, and you know, where are you getting this data from? Because we've done episodes on that as well. So, like, like let's assume that all of those issues are solved and, and you know, the, the actual creators are getting paid for their data that, you know, that, that they created from, from a human perspective, like, you know, and then go from that point rather than, because, again, I could see that limiting the, the creativity of a lot of these models if you're not allowed to use, you know, a lot of that um, data for right look, look these models would never have been able to been be formed if they didn't have access to all that information and right. so this is right as you said we won't get into it the one thing i always point out to people like this is also like this isn't just about the us this is about the world so like japan has already kind of put a line in the sand with this and basically say hey if it's on the internet you can if a person can read it a model can train on it so, oh okay end of story so like like and Japan has had this in law for several years now. So like it will be interesting. I mean and I'm not saying that's the right way to go by any stretch. Like you know Western Europe, the US, all these other countries have to decide what it is that they're going to do with copyright rules, but you know just the one thing we all have to keep in mind even if we decide this is the right thing in the US, it doesn't necessarily mean that every other country in the world is going to abide by that. Right. Because if, if you have things that are being published or displayed in countries like Japan, well, that's going to be subject to Japanese law. All right. So I, I want to get into the, the three forms that I was talking about. One was the yeah. text generation tools, uh, image generators, and then some audio generator stuff. So let's start with the text generating tools. What are some of the creative ways that, you know, in, in prompts or ideas that you've given it? Um, just to just to give you a sense of what I've done so far, um, I've, I've had it come up with uh, Dungeons and Dragons character names and backstories for the group that I play with. Um, I've tried to cr have it create band names for me based on my characteristics. Like if I ever started a band, um, you know, a middle aged white guy, uh, you know, playing classic 80s songs and it came up with a list and it was it was awful. Um, song lyrics, poems, things like that. And then I did try to get it to write topical based jokes for like a late night host based yeah. on, you know, I said, hey, look at the, the top 10 stories on the Wall Street Journal today and write me a list of jokes based on those. And those were um, bad and horrendous and really offensive in some cases. Okay. <laughs> um, because the jokes were trying to do puns off of the headlines 
and they didn't realize that you were making fun of people that were killed in something or, you know, (laughs) so that was, that was, that was, I didn't go any further than that. I mean, I suppose I could have said like, you know, try to show some, uh, but, and this was maybe six months ago, so I should probably, again, try it again to see if it, if it recognizes that, but, um, you know, and then there are the non-creative ways that we're seeing a lot of businesses do, which is write an email or write a performance self-evaluation or write a blog post or a press release, things like that. So those are the, the business type tools that, that a lot of these text generators can do. What, so what have you done that, that showcases the creativity um, for generating either a short block of text or a long block of text or stories or what? Yeah. Um, the one thing that I would say, generally speaking, with w- whenever you're working with these models, like I would treat these like kind of a unpaid intern. Like if you give it an initial like, hey, write me, and, and I'm not saying this is what you did, but just generally speaking, if somebody said to it, hey, give me a funny joke. Um, that's almost the equivalent of like walking to somebody on the street and just saying, hey, tell me a funny joke. Like they're going to really struggle with that. Like, yeah, they might be able to pop something out, but like, well, what context? What do you find funny and all that? And that's where the magic really starts to come in with these models. So anytime I've been able to really get creative, so to speak, with these models, it is a constant back and forth. Uh, It could be something like, you know, I'm trying to think of a funny title for this article. Here's the text of the article, I'll upload the whole thing. I, you know, I'm thinking something like this, something like this. I want it to rhyme. I want it, you know, and that's like literally what I would give it. And I would say, give me 10 different solutions for that, 10, 10 potential headlines for that. And out of those 10, most are gonna be awful. But the thing for you, like as being on the other side, you need to just kind of find the glimmer and say like, oh, number seven, that beginning is good and the theme of number three is good. Right. Can you combine those together and give me another 10? And that's when you really start to get the model to work for you and, and to be able to come up with like creative solutions for that. And then you say like, oh, well, that makes me think of this. And then you insert your own idea. Like, well, I thought of this. Can What can you do with that now? And it then becomes much more of a writing partner. And that's the best way that I would kind of iterate and be creative as far as developing text with it. A great example to use is something I actually did for my daughter's birthday um, last year. She wanted a scavenger hunt. And so I was like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's, let's work with this. So we're going to do it in our neighborhood. I kind of laid out some landmarks, explained to the model what we're going to do. I'm like, I want a rhyming scheme for this. I want this. I want to generally have these themes here. And there was a prompt. I I probably spent two hours going back and forth on this thing. But by the end, I had a really tight script that actually had an AI read. So Mm -hmm. like an AI model read and all the kids watched that. So it was like they're seeing a robot talk to them about the future (laughs) and all this. And like it's been transported to the past and now they're going on a scavenger hunt and all this. And, you know, and that was just, again, constantly iterating back and forth, back and forth on that. Um, One of my favorite quotes, I I won't won't say it, uh, you know, Hemingway said that all first drafts are S, Mm -hmm. say the word. Um, but like, you know, they're, they're junk, they're garbage. And even if you're Ernest Hemingway, like wherever you start, it's not good. It is the exact same truth with AI. Also, so that it, it feels like that's the big question for almost anybody that's, that's experimenting with the creative types of, of generative AI tools is, is there an assumption that people were like, well, I just only want to do one prompt and then see what it does. And I don't want to take the, the next two or three steps, like, you know, going back and forth with an AI, um, because then that seems like work. <laughs> and that yeah. seems like, well, you know, this isn't saving me any time. If it takes me 30 minutes to get the AI to do something, I should have just used that 30 minutes and drawn something myself or, yeah. or you know, found a clip yeah. art piece or something like that or, or yeah. you know, just came up with an idea of, of, of my 10 names by myself. So do you think that most people are giving up after that first prompt? And maybe that's why we don't see creativity where we could. I think there's a major disconnect, disconnect with people's perception of where AI is today and where AI actually is today. And, <laughs> and I think Keith, that is, you, you are nailing it there. People will see AI generated videos. I was just watching a few of them. They, they do, there's a whole series on YouTube where they kind of do 1950 style 
uh, movie trailers of like the X Men or yep, He Man I, or yeah, yeah, I've yeah, seen some I, of those. Yeah, beautifully done, beautifully done. Like you know, they got the voiceover and all that. I can't imagine how much time it's spent on that. Like, like people think like, oh, you just put it in preps prompts that says, hey, generate a video that no, 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 no. <laughs> like there are, there's a lot of work that goes into that behind the scenes. So to right. make a one, one minute trailer, I, I would just guess it's probably 20, 30, 40 hours of work probably for the person who's doing it. And that's kind of the reality of it. Like, like there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and that's why I think some people are so standoffish. They're like, well, you, you know, oh my God, well, you just made this with AI. Well, yeah, but the person spent 40 hours making this video actually. So like right. it was much more of a creative collaborative process that they actually have. It's different than what we've seen before. And, and that that's the reality of what we have today. Like it is, you can't just say, so So again, I do this with my, my pen name, uh, Alex Irons. I basically say, write me a book. You got to do a little bit more than that, but effectively, that's what I'm doing. Every single one of those books sucks. <laughs> I would just say it flat out. I would not read it. I would not recommend people buying those books, which is one of the reasons why I give all the money to charity if people do buy the book, because like I don't feel right. right. But it's an experiment because someday it might not suck. But do you know what? In the 14 books I've done on there, None of these are things of like, oh my God, yeah, I'm telling my friends, you got to read this. No, <laughs> no, humans do so much of a better job than that. Right. But an AI can help you read uh, or it can help you write. It can, you know, help you do all of these things. And that's where the magic is going to come in. Like, so for the things in your job where you don't like as much, you know, oh, I've got to proofread this thing again. Maybe it would help to have somebody else read it for me. And AI can actually do a pretty good job of just uploading. A f I do this with every article I write. I, I first say, hey, can you fact check this for me? Okay. Then I usually say, which, which is a weird thing to ask for an AI to fact check. But yeah. It actually does a really good job of just kind of going through and saying, okay, these seem to be the facts. This is, you know, what I believe to be. And then I run it through two separate engines and it'll kind of fact check my article for me and do a pretty good job in just a matter of seconds of doing that. Um, and then also, like, give me suggestions. What can I do here? What's the weakest point of this? Be a critic of this. You can have it take on these personas, and those are the ways it helps you out. Like, you, AI is not taking over, like, your job full force right. anytime soon. Do you have a, a favorite tool right now for text generation? Do you start with ChatGPT uh, or, or one of the other kind of tools? Um, or do you have a specific set like, okay, for this idea, I'm going to go with this model, this one, I'm going to go with this tool, et cetera. Like for like, yeah. where do you start? As of today, I, I guess I would have to say it's probably Claude, but I still use chat GPT a lot. Yeah. Uh, whenever you're doing something, I mean, here's a great hack for anybody to have out there. If you have access to, um, you know, ChatGPT, Claude, and there's others out there. Um, Mistral is out there. That's largely free. Go to meta.ai. That's largely free. There's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of free ones as well. If you're not sure, what I always tell people is just, okay, take an initial prompt, copy that, and paste that into each one of those models. In the free and ones, right? See, yeah, yeah. Just put it on all of them, exact same prompt, and just look real quickly and say like, oh, on this one, Meta actually gave me the best result. And do you know what? continue the conversation with Meta. Okay. That's the one thing I recommend to people is try it in a few different models and then you're going to naturally see, oh, when I ask these types of questions, Meta or Claude or Perplexity seems to be better right now. Uh, but that can always change just as, as you said before. People yeah. Do you, always change. do you think that the models are, or the tools are going to get more specific depending on what you want it to do? Like instead of using a general GPT for something, you know, you'll see something that is like story time creator or, yeah. you know, something even more specific that, that of, of a, you know, email, email creator, um, things like that. Or is that going to just be built into some of these other tools that you'll see? I think the answer right now is both. Yeah. So, so for, you know, a great example of that is, you know, email. If you look, um, Microsoft, Google, you know, all the email providers are building this in. Superhuman, which is a, a kind of one that sits across it, is an AI for email providers. So you can get like standalone. It'll just like work with your email clients and it'll help you write better emails. Um, or you could just go to ChatGPT. A lot of these are frankly working off of 
GPT-4 or Meta's Llama or whatever model. They usually have one of these models in the background. Right, right. Um, that's actually powering it. So, you, But it's just kind of putting it in the interface where you're actually doing the work. So yeah. you can kind of get it either way. Like, like one of the things I like about having that ChatGPT subscription is that when you go to that page you can see all of the different AI tools and maps and, and little modules to try that rather than just act, act, you know, asking a general prompt. You can say like, okay, logo creator, I want you to create a logo. And then it asks me some questions before it, it generates the logo. So I get a sense of it knows what it's doing. Um, yes. You know, so. And, uh, and one of the great things that you could do in ChatGPT, not all of them have this functionality, is you could create something called custom instructions. And in custom instructions, you could say like, hey, this is how I want you to work with me. Yeah. I want you to actually ask me questions to make sure you understand my query before giving me an answer. Because by nature, they're just looking to solve a problem is what the models are trying to do. But if you actually tell them in the instructions, and you can do this, you don't have to go in custom instructions. You could just say, hey, you know, Meta, if anything's unclear in this, ask me questions, but here's what I'm looking for. Um, there are different ways to do that, yeah. but it's always good to do that because otherwise it's going to make a, this is exactly how humans interact, right? I mean, you say something to somebody like, hey, I need you to do this job. I'm going to have a whole host of assumptions that I make internally. And some of those are wrong. Some of those are going to be yeah. you know, correct, but all right, let's, work let, let, humans. let's move on to the, some of the image generators. Um, I'm going to give you yeah. some examples of stuff. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with a lot of the image generator stuff. Um, every, when, when Dolly first came out and I heard about it, my go-to, Im, my go-to prompt, and you're going to get a chuckle out of this, is I try to get it to draw Dorothy from the Golden Girls um, eating cheesecake with Alf, the alien puppet. Because... I just feel like that is just so it's so 80s and iconic, but also yeah. very, very hard to, to replicate. Um, yes. And every and, and even even now with all of the good stuff that comes out, it never gets Alf right. Um, yeah. and, and it tries to get Dorothy as just some kind of middle aged woman, uh, but it doesn't necessarily grab B. Arthur from, you know, from image. Yeah. So, and again, I understand that they have guardrails now. So, um, I may have to go to the Elon Musk one because maybe the Elon Musk one, which really has no guardrails might be able to give me that image. Um, uh, so, and then I've, 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 I've tried to, to have it do an album cover, like of a, of a person sitting on a bed, listening to music with a dog in the room while outside there's a nuclear war going on. I thought that was always a cool yeah. kind of a yeah. rock band type of album cover. Um, I've helped, uh, it's helped, I've helped my daughter write a book report because the assignment was, was they were reading a book about a dystopian world and the image, the, um, the assignment was to do an Instagram post for those characters right. in the book and so we were able to get images that she then used and then she did the rest of it herself with you know what the post would look like but the actual image she just we had we had uh i think mid journey or or chat gb do that and then i had wow. a a physical photo of me dressed up like a alligator costume an alligator mascot um and then i was getting a hug from a friend of mine um and so i took that photo and tried to recreate it with with chat gpt and and it just it just it's Forget it. Like it's, it still can't yeah. do that. So yeah. what are some of the, the, the more interesting things you've done with image generators? Yeah. Um, so first let's talk about guardrails real yeah. quickly. Cause I mean, I think that's actually a really interesting point of what, why is it not able to get B Arthur right, but it's able to get some other things right. Um, so one of the experiments I ran, um, so generally speaking, I'm just going to put a couple out there. So XAI uses one called flux. Um, so this is Elon's company. They're using one called Flux. Generally, very few guardrails. Midjourney, similar company, probably my favorite image generation. Actually, almost no guardrails there either. ChatGPT slash Dolly, they actually do have guardrails. Yeah. Um, but they're not perfect, though. So one of the things I did, and this is something else that I wrote about, I, I actually took a list of the top 50 cartoon characters in, like, U.S. history. Um, and I put each of them through... Dolly. And I'm like, hey, draw me a picture of Goofy. Draw me a picture of Yosemite Sam. Draw mm -hmm. me a picture of this, blah, blah, blah. And I literally just kept on going down the list. Um, and it was really interesting because there are some holes in the guardrails for that. Like, for example, it said it wouldn't generate a picture of Donald Duck for me, but every damn time it gave me a perfect picture of Donald Duck. 
And, and, and like, so like there's, you know, there's this internal struggle. There's all these models. This it's like, no, and I'm like, is this Donald Duck? It's like, no, that's not Donald Duck. I'm like, you can't tell me that's not Donald <laughs> Duck. And that's what I think I even titled the article. So it's a weird thing going on with the model. They've been trained on all this stuff, but they're trying to put a filter on the front end that says, hey, let's not generate Mickey Mouse out of this thing. Right. And that's what chat gpt does effectively saying like hey please don't you know don't generate mickey if i see something that looks like mickey then then just stop it like we're not going to show that to the user mid journey doesn't do that you could do mickey same thing with the uh, flux xai so probably what's happening with elf and b arthur there's actually probably not enough training data in there on those two which is i know kind of hard to believe right right because again but, uh, again I'm, I'm bypassing the guardrails because who really is, is is anyone care if if you have an image of p arthur um but you're right the the, the training i mean they did sort of know what the golden girls was because they did have a kitchen that looked like the kitchen that, that they probably were in got a comp- it's probably not in the training data properly flagged it's probably getting like rue mcclanahan and betty white right. it's probably amalgamating all of their faces and it doesn't yeah. fully know distinctly who they are and and i have so a, and I have a, you know i have a friend who was getting into the mid-journey stuff for a while and he was posting some really good images of pedro pascal guest ho- oh, you know cool. guest starring on the golden girls it was like well he was able to figure that out like i don't know i get frustrated when like i can't think of the right prompts to get something you know of what i want so an exact same thing as we said with the text prompts like this is a world where you just got to play with it yeah Um, i do something i will often take the exact same prompt i will take it into um xai i will put in mid journey i will put in dolly dolly there's one called imogen which is also free out there i will take the same prompt put it in all four of them and just see which one gets me closest to start. Yeah. And yeah. then from there, I iterate. I'm like, oh, that doesn't quite seem right. Let me do that. But like this model was closest. So I'm just going to keep going down this path now. Right. And again, similar to text, you just, it's just kind of guess and check. Just keep on repeating, keep on iterating until you get exactly what you're looking for. Why, why do these image generators have such a bad, um, why why can't they do letters and, and words correctly? Because that's what I've been frustrated by lately is that th- there was a jump that they made. Like the first time you had to try to add, you know, put letters on your image, um, it was just as garbled. It was garbled gobbledygook. Yeah. And then I think Mid Journey figured it out or there was another, you know, there was another iteration and they got words. You know, if you say type, you know, type of word that says Keith, it'll actually spell it Keith. But then sometimes it doesn't. And then, I, you know, there's a correction tool and I and I highlight the word and I say, make it say this. And it won't. It, it, it's it's sometimes it's, it goes worse when you say that. It's like even less. Keith, yeah. Like when you do that. Like yes. I was you know yeah. what I was I was creating logos for my uh, my brother's fantasy football league of all of yeah. the team names. And I, you know, and the team names are a little weird and, but they are, you know, this, I'm spelling them correctly and I, and, and it would just, it would try to regenerate the images like, no, I love the image. You just have to put the text in. And then at one point, one of the GPTs told me, um, just go to Photoshop and do this. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> just gave up. Yeah. You're just like, you know, well, you, you know, you could probably get better results if you just take this logo and put it and then add it, add the text in Photoshop. I was like, well, no, I don't want to do that. Like I want you to do it. <laughs> well, I think this is similar to what I'm just going to call the B. Arthur problem. Now. So, so I, I mean, so the problem used to be, so it would see things and it would recognize, well, these are letters, a T, an E, an N. It would yeah. see all of these things like, yeah, that's a letter, whatever. It kind of looks like that. It has some sort of shape there. Um, it wouldn't uniquely understand the letters though. And so that's why it would just like be generating something and it would say like, okay, it looks like you want letters up here. And it would just put some weird symbolism that sort of looks like a letter and occasionally it would actually look like a letter, but it's not the letters that you were looking for. So similar to, again, similar to the Golden Girls where it's just like, okay, you just want an old white woman in there. So right. like, we don't know specifically who Betty White or B. Arthur is, but we're just going to do that. I think what has happened since then is they have specifically trained the models on the letters and they've probably given it, you know, 20,000 examples of the letter E looking a whole bunch of different ways. And basically the model now knows whenever you're asking for an E, it's going to look something like this. Yeah. You're asking for a T, it looks something like this. And I think that is probably what's happened. So most of the models now pretty close with letters. Okay. Just like it used to always be, you know, six fingers that were being in there. 
that's largely been fixed now. And, and because then they just have to train the models over it. When you just kind of initially let the models go free and just be like, okay, do whatever, it doesn't know, well, most people have only five fingers. So you need to normal, you need to look for this and normalize that. Um, you know, and so these are the advancements that we've seen in the models. And again, they're just like the image generation models are just getting so much better. So like, with that, with that being said, Mike, so we're, we're yeah. recording this, uh, uh, early September. This is going to, this is published in early October. Uh, yeah. as you can tell what this, the current state is, can you tell now whether an image has been created by an AI or a human? Like, cause we're getting to that point where if I, if we, if we did a quiz, you know, would we be able to 100% identify it? And, and obviously, because you and I use these tools on a regular basis, you sort of can tell, mainly because the types of images that we see out there is probably that first or second level of, of um, prompt engineering. Like, you know, they've only gone to one or two levels. And so I can usually tell if it, because I, I can usually tell if something has been generated by AI, not because of any flaws in the image, but more of the, the general style that we're seeing. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a problem too. It's, it's, it, it might, it might give you a beautiful image and a perfect looking image, but I can probably guess that it was AI rather than done by an artist. Yeah. I mean, I think the AIs typically have a style. Mid journey has a style. Like, like, I mean, you could show me a mid journey image and I'm like, Oh yeah, that's generated mid journey or, or so forth. Yeah. Um, but within Midjourney, you can do things within the prompting to make it just look more photorealistic, more whatever, more more whatever it might be as part of it, which kind of gets you away from that style to something that's much more specific. Uh, the New York Times had a really good piece a couple months ago where they just showed 10 pictures and you had to vote, is it AI or is it not AI? I think I got eight out of 10 mm -hmm. on that. So like, yeah, I almost got it. But, you know, maybe if I was real, you know, maybe if I was spending a ton of time looking at this, looking at every pixel and so forth, I've been able to, you know, get a 10. But no, I mean, it's it's tough. There are absolutely it's, it's like saying what's photoshopped versus not. Right. Um, you know, I, I mean, again, the thing is, we we've been able to manipulate images for what thirty plus years now using tools like Photoshop and the capabilities there. It's just not that everybody in the world had easy access to be able to do these on mass uh, within seconds. Right, and now that's the, that's the difference today. And now you've got the issue of a lot of these things are going to be on our smartphones. Uh, Google just came out with the Pixel Nine that had a lot in it. You know, Apple's about to come out with with all of their tools on their next uh, iPhone. So you're going to start seeing more and more people doing this because there are probably a lot of people that don't want to use these tools on a desktop, um, yeah. but they would they'd be happily you know doing it on on the phone. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, if you're taking pictures in portrait mode, you're using AI. I mean, that's just that's just a given now. Yeah. Um, most of the processing, like especially on a Pixel phone or an iPhone, uh, most of the image processing is actually done like digitally. It is not actually done within the lenses um, for so many pictures. So like it is already, you know, so you're using AI as kind of step one. Um, to what ends are you using the AI is the question that you're asking here, Keith, and is, is a good one. Because, yeah. yeah, I'm hearing the same thing where you take a picture of me in my garage and you cross out the bicycle behind me and you say, well, put a uh, Velociraptor back there and it's going to make a pretty darn convincing Velociraptor that was in my garage. But I also and know that Velociraptors <laughs> don't exist, so I'm pretty sure it's been yeah. enhanced. <laughs> but it's gonna look good. Though. Well, I do know that bicycles exist, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah. So I mean, this is this is what we're facing there. And so you know, there are questions on um, you know. So could we water, watermark these pictures? It's actually gonna be a little bit. So the original Dolly actually had a watermark in the lower right hand corner of every picture, but yep. you could easily pop that out. There are some things you can do with digital images. So there's probably a little bit more you can do to make sure something is AI and labeled, but then you could just take that picture, you could Photoshop it a little bit, you can do stuff to kind of remove that and make it just really difficult to yeah. do so. And that, that gets us down into other territories of, of yeah. ethics and, and responsibilities of publishers 100%. and things like that. 100%. Um, all right, but so I guess would you say that at this point, a, the AI image generators are, are really good that they could fool a lot of people? Yes, yeah. 100%. They, they fool me. 
Okay. They pull me all the uh, just as so there's a great AI newsletter for anybody who's interested. It's free. It's called Neuron, I think. And every Thursday they come out with one. They always have a real picture versus AI picture. Um, I was 100 percent convinced that the, the real like I got it wrong wow. last week. And, I, and to the point where I'm like, no, they got a bit. They did something here. I mean, I think they're you know trying a little bit prove a point maybe with some of this stuff. But like, yeah. It's it is darn darn tough sometimes. If somebody is trying to fool you, um, it can be, and that's why you have to rely on other things. Like so, like if it's at an event or something, are there multiple angles that were taken? You know, like like there there are other ways right. to kind of prove this out. Um, but for a single photo, it's going to be you know effectively for a naked eye, it's going to be impossible to tell was this AI generated. All right. So last category I want to get to jump into. This is the, the, the newest category. I would, I would call that this um, audio generation AI. So it's either, yeah. I, there's two areas that I want to talk about. One is uh, voice replication. And you've seen a lot of tools yeah. that can basically, you know, we've, we've now talked for about 45 minutes here on the show. Um, that's more than enough. I think, you know, they only need 30 seconds of my voice to basically yeah. create a, a you know, an AI voice of me and, and you. Um, uh, so there's that category, but then there's also now song creators and that's more on the creative side of things. So I want to yeah. talk about the song creative types. Cause we've already, we've talked about those, you know, you basically duplicating me and getting to me to say anything. Cause there's a lot of other issues there, but just in terms of the creativity of someone creating a song, um, there's at least two tools that I know of. One was Suno and I can't remember the other, the other, the other Studio, one probably is what, Audio. Yeah. And those it's audio were, without the A. And that's it's one of those things. Back. It's like type in a text prompt and we'll write a song about it. So like the first couple ones I've done were like, oh, I'll write a song about my two dogs. Uh, I have a, we have a beagle and a cockapoo and, you know, and they're best friends. And, you know, <laughs> but then do it in the style of like James Brown or, you know, you pick yeah. a style in it and it yeah. comes out with and the lyrics are eh, kind of iffy because, again, they're using text generation AI to create the yeah. song. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, they, they, they rhyme dog with dog <laughs> and, yeah. or, yeah. you know, they don't get yeah. the, the whole rhyming lyric thing. Um, and, but the music in, itself was, you yeah. know, not bad. It, and again, they do it in like 30 seconds or a minute. Um, and, the, and again, that's the magic trick. So, yes. um, you know, the other thing I did was I took a song that was created 38 years ago, celebrating the 300th anniversary of the city of Albany. I'm, I might be the only person in the world that remembers this um, song, but I tried to get it to recreate the, uh, a song. And, and, and what was interesting is that it knew specific street locations in the city of Albany. Um, and it put that into the song. So that was pretty impressive within the lyrics. Um, but again, the music is not anything like, you know, that it's going to become a top 40 hit. So. Um, what, what have you yeah, done but, on the song side? But I think there's so much potential in these tools just for creativity, for just for fun as part of it. When yeah. Udio launched, I spent so much time that weekend literally just generating songs for my friends and then just texting them to them. Yeah. I mean, I would like, you know, I would say like, hey, in this style, write a song about that time that friend and I, we went to the, we went down to the beach and like, you know, you know, and this happened, blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And, and it will like, it will do that. And it, it's it's uncanny because it's like wow this sounds like a actual song that was actually just produced and it made that in seconds uh one of my favorite things that i did with the tool is i actually took my resume fed it into claude and said hey take my background and make this into like an old blues song yeah so, you know just give, give me the and then what you could actually do is then you could take that text stick it into Udio and then say, now, hey, with these lyrics, make this into a blues song. And like, I got the best 30 second resume out there because like, <laughs> it's like, right. like this beautiful old timey blues style song about me and my resume. And I'm like, this is the most incredible thing ever. And look, there's a whole lot of copyright issues with this. Like right, the, the right. recording industry is like suing the heck out of like these companies right now like that. It's, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be there. Right. Putting that aside, as right. we did before, there is so much room for creativity. Like just, I, you know, I made a short film recently. So now I was able to put a whole soundtrack underneath that thing. Like what was I supposed to do otherwise? It would have been all, well, 
I have to get licensed or whatever. Yeah, you would have like, to go royalty free or, you know, some of those. Royalty, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Versus to just go in there. And like one of the things I did was like I could actually make a title song about my movie. So I actually wrote the lyrics for this. And then I'm like, OK, in this short little movie, I'm going to have it just kind of play out on this. I'm going to write the lyrics and I'm going to have it develop a song. And the greatest thing about it is like you can put the lyrics in there and you can do 20 different styles. Um, la- last point on this, because I was yeah. actually just with somebody um, he was, um, I was over in Europe recently and meeting with somebody who was a, a musician and we were talking about this and this now gives him the opportunity to take his music and like literally just completely change styles on it to just see like, well, what would this song sound like this way? Like, what, what if I just like took the lyrics for this like hip hop song and made this into country? Right. Uh, and I did this with that. And like, and just like the experimentation, like I'm so excited about what is going to come from this because it's just shortening like experimentation cycles. And you can try out 10, 15 things so quickly. And it still takes that discerning ear to say like, oh my gosh, there was like, three seconds of that snip song that I'm going to take that snippet. I'm not actually going to use that in here. And that's where like the real value is going to come. Right. So like, this is something I'm so, it's just so much fun to play with. And I'm just so excited about where it can take music and create. We just have to wait to see what happens with these lawsuits. Cause you know, if you don't, you don't mess around with the recording industry. It's, they take it serious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Recording industry does not mess and, around. And again, same with same with the copyright uh, people from the tech side of the world. You know, the books and novels and plays and things like that. They they've got some pretty good lawyers as well. So, um, yeah. what I what I what I liked about the, one of the last things you said, Mike, was where you take one type of tool and then feed it into another type of tool. And I start and I'm starting to think that multi generation, multi AI generation of content is something that we'll also see um again like you know adding an image and then adding music to it and you know and doing all of that things i think is another level of creativity that we're not there yet um but as people experiment with it that they will get there do you feel that that way too absolutely yeah look i think we're going down the path where like it is you're going to have these specialty tools that do images really well that maybe like it's uh, stitched together images into a video really well. Maybe some of them will even more specifically, well, they do transitions well, they'll do this well. And like, these are all of the different tools that the director or the just the creator out there is going to have. And, you know, so like how many teams have their own like theme song in a business place? Like you could do that today. Like what would that have taken to do a few years ago? Right. So, like your team of 10 people, well, you'd have someone with talent or someone who knows somebody or someone with money. It was all about access. And now access is, oh, I can just go on this site, play around for an hour. And now our team has a theme song. How cool is that? So like those are right. the opportunities that really, you know. It, it, it does feel like for, for a lot of those those initial creators that, that don't really have the money or the budget to do that. But now I'm starting to worry about the, the people that do have budgets that would hire humans. Would they be tempted to, to go the AI route or even just start with the AI route, get, get the ideas and then present that to a professional um, and maybe that's how the professional still gets gets paid. But what I'm worried about is is that these marketing teams or whatever would just be like they'd be happy with whatever the the AI tool produces and doesn't go to that next level to add even more creativity. Oh, you've not worked with some of the marketing teams I have. They're so specific about like every little frame and something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like, like, um, but but no no. I look. I think I think in reality. Uh, I, I wrote a whole three-part series about job loss yeah. related to AI. And and one of the things is got the illusion of history. And in the illusion of history, we kind of think our jobs today are going to be the same as our jobs going forward. And we think of our jobs today as the same as they were, like, you know, going back. Well, reality, probably what you do today is very different than it was five, ten years ago. Right. What you do today is not going to be the same job. Your job will evolve. Like, our job is a bunch of little tasks that we have. And AI is really going to help with some of those tasks. And hopefully, I mean, the hope of all this is that AI is going to up-level all of us so that we are able to do more with that. Will some jobs completely be eliminated? Like, if you're on Upwork right now and you're writing blog posts for people, like, you don't pretty much have a job anymore. Yeah, That used to be a job on Upwork. That doesn't exist because, you know what, if you're writing a mediocre 
blog posts, ChatGPT does that just fine. Right. If you're writing a great blog post, like at a you know PR agency or whatever, you might be using ChatGPT to help, but you know there's still things for you to do there. So I think that's one thing that we're going to see happen is like our jobs will just continue to evolve using these tools, um, and you know hopefully, hopefully. So so one final something. question, and I think and I yeah. think you've answered this, Mike, earlier, but you know are we as humans expecting too much from these tools? You know, we've been impressed with the magic tricks from the side of the, of the speed and some of the accuracy and some of the fact that it can get some images correct. But are we expecting blockbuster movies? Are we expecting top 40 songs? Are we expecting artwork that can then, you know, be displayed in a museum? Um, and, and maybe that these high expectations, then when we see the averageness, we then get frustrated and disillusioned. Yeah, um, I think that's right. <laughs> I, I, look, I think that's spot, spot on. I, I think, you know, here, here's how I would actually wrap that up. Um, humans can do some things amazing. We are so good, we're so talented, like, like just the world that we have built around us, it is an incredible thing. And you know what, we're finding like AI is almost like to call it a species, but like a just like a new form, new worker, new whatever <laughs> that is there that is going to do some things amazing as well. It's going to take time for us to figure out like what are the things that AI really does good, and and you know and better than us. What are the things that humans do? Like you know nobody's asking humans to do like longhand division calculations anymore. Yeah, right. Computers do that better. Which yeah. is like okay, and that's the same kind of decisions we have to make with AI. Um, and I don't mean to be dismissive because look, I'm a creative myself. I mean, and like it, it does worry me. What does this future really look like? Right. But I think the more that you embrace the tools, the more that you understand the tools, the more that you even understand the limitations of these tools because they are not perfect. They take a lot of work. But the more you play with them today, the further you're going to be able to see like, oh my gosh, it really helps me cook dinner. <laughs> it really helps me write a blog post. It really helps me just with the blank sheet problem. Because yeah. I just stare at a blank sheet for 30 minutes. I don't know what to write. At least give me something so it lets me work 30 minutes faster. And I could just edit it. I throw it all out. But do you know what? It, it helps me. Those are the things like for each of us individually we're going to be figuring out. Have, have you used, I'm sorry, this is, that just reminded me, have you used any of the AI tools to um, build a recipe for you yet? Have Constantly. You, Really? Constantly. Yes. And the food yes. and the food tastes good. Oh my god! I, I literally just we even had friends over. I made chicken cordon bleu on Friday for the family. We were having friends over on Sunday, and all the kids and everyone were like, "Can you make that chicken cordon bleu again?" I'm like, "Sure." So like that was purely ChatGPT recipe, and ChatGPT knows about me. I'm lazy. I don't like to clean up a lot. Um, I don't like to add in too many spices. So yep. like the more multiple things you can, like I, I wanted simple, I wanted efficient. It knows all these things about me. The best, one of the best packs, hacks about ChatGPT too, I was cooking something and asked for sake. I don't know anything about sake. I had to go to the store, buy sake. I'm there. There's a whole wall of sake. And I'm like, what is this? I literally took out ChatGPT. I took a picture of the wall of sake. I'm like, which one of these should I buy? And it was like, oh, well, given the recipe, you should buy this one or this one. Wow, interesting. Like, there you go. All I, right. I mean, and so you can do, you can even take pictures of your food to say like, hey, does this look done? <laughs> like, I mean, you could do all of this kind of stuff or, or, oh crap, I've done this. I use garlic powder instead of garlic salt. How should I adjust that? And it will tell you that like for recipes, it is unbelievable. Like. I mean, I'm not a professional chef, although there was something recently about a chef who was actually using this in their, like, uh, was uncovered for his pizzas. Yeah. Because he was coming up with these crazy pizzas. It was all chat GPT. Oh, boy. Uh, so it's it's a really, I highly, highly, highly recommend it if you're a, um, a struggling chef. Like the, the only thing I know is not to put glue on my pizza, which was another <laughs> chat yes. GPT thing that, that came out That's recently because right. they were using stuff from Reddit. And, like, don't go to, don't use Reddit as your... Uh, as your yeah, database. Well, and it's because if you want to actually use pizza in a commercial, you use glue, right? right. You mix his glue in there. So yeah. that's where the connection was between that. And in the, the model doesn't know. It just knows, yeah, put glue on pizza yep. if you want to make it more stringy. Yeah. 
Uh, Mike, we could we could go that. on for we could go on for hours. I want to have you back at some point. We'll keep talking about Please. some some creative uses of AI. Uh, you know, and then we'll get a, a, a catch up on 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 how the, the the models are doing. So you know, I'll see you in about six months or so, and we'll we'll, we'll get a we'll get an update. Sound good? Keith, this was super fun. All right, all right. Thanks for being on the show, Mike. Take care. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and add any thoughts you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.